All right, thank you very much for coming to see me today. Yes, my name is Nick Whitteson, um, and the title of my talk is How to Make It Look Like You Know What You Are Doing. Um, the other title is How to Give Yourself Imposter Syndrome, um, which is basically the story of my life. So, um, yes, I work for Canva. Um, Canva is a uh, graphic design platform. So um, we have um, an iOS app, an Android, sorry, a um, iPhone app, um, iPad app, Android, and also we're on the web. Um, iPhone app looks a little bit like this. Um, and it's a platform in the way that you can create um, designs, like posters, flyers, um, business cards, that kind of thing. Um, but you can um, access them anywhere on any platform, um, and everything's drag and drop and easy to use. So part of our, um, our journey at Canva has been that um, in the last uh, four and a half years that I've worked there, it's always been about getting things out as fast as we can and, um, and making sure that we validate our ideas along the way. So um, I want to have a chat about three things today um, to, to make it look like, uh, to, to kind of help everyone, um, I guess, uh, make it look like they know what they're doing, um, even though, as you'll see, most of the time we're just kind of uh, uh, hoping for the best. So. Let's, um, first thing I want to have a chat about is, uh, is the approach that we take to, uh, to developing software. So um, uh, one thing that, I, uh, that kind of really struck me as I was looking for ways to describe why we, um, we take the approach that we do is um, a quote from Sophocles, which is, I have no desire to suffer twice in reality and then in retrospect. And I think that really speaks to the way that um, we always say that hindsight is 2020. Like at the end of a project, we're like, oh, I definitely would have done that differently. I definitely would have um, done X, Y, Z. Um, I actually ended up spending a bunch of time on something that no one uses, um, or that I, I didn't spend enough time on the thing that everyone does want to use. Um, and, uh, and the way that this quote kind of, well, the, my interpretation of this quote is that um, we should really try and make sure that we're not all, we're not suffering twice. So suffering in the, when we're when we're creating things, like agonising over the decisions that we make, um, and then also at the end of it, um, making like regretting the choices that we've made. So um, my um, my take on this is that if hindsight is where you make your most important discoveries, then your problem is really finding the shortest path to get to to that hindsight. Um, I have no idea if I said that, um, but that's what I do say sometimes. So um, if someone else said that, I apologize. Um, so really, the approach, the approach that we take is that we always aim for MVP. And if you haven't heard of MVP before, it's the, the minimum viable product um, of, of an idea. Um, it's often represented in an uh, image that looks a little bit like this. Um, and what it really means is taking an approach to, to designing software and to um, implementing software where you deliver value to the users as soon as you can. So in the top example, um, if you're, say, building a car, because software engineering loves car analogies, um, you build one wheel first, you build two more wheels, you build the body of a car, and then you finally have a working car. Um, but you note that the, the user doesn't really, like they actually want to be able to get around. Um, they don't care about having a wheel, it's not useful to them. They don't care about having two wheels or even the body of a car with two wheels on it. They only really care when they have a product that helps them get around. So having an approach that lets you um, fill some of the user needs um, early on helps to move, um, helps to, to um, understand kind of more of what the user is actually trying to do. So in the bottom example, skateboard lets them get around. Um, skateboard with handles lets them stay on the skateboard. Um, uh, a bike, much better than a skateboard for, for most people staying on top of it. Um, motorbike, get around faster. Finally, a car, more safe and easier to use. So. Um, my advice there is get something working as soon as possible. So find, um, find what the actual, um, the actual minimum part of your product that adds value to a user and ship that as early as you can because that helps you get to that hindsight. Um, only, only when you evaluate it though. So you have to make sure that when you ship something, you actually look at how it's performing, look at if it's actually what the user wanted um, and check your assumptions and, and then do the second version with the value of your hindsight. So always make sure that um, you're incorporating that back into it. Now, um, second part is really the frame of mind that you have to take in order to, um, in order to get things done quickly. So um, probably my biggest piece of advice, if you're going to take away anything from this talk, is um, when you're looking at trying to save time um, in, in engineering, 
Um, stop thinking like a developer. Um, often as developers, we come up with developer solutions to problems. Um, and those are really great. So they're actually necessary for a lot of really hard problems. But um, there's a lot of really uh, simple problems to, uh, sorry, simple solutions to complex problems that we often overlook because we're looking for the complex answers. So um, my advice to you is to start thinking like a user. If you, um, if you look at apps, you don't, um, I mean, you may, but most people don't look at um, the way that they're built and the way that they're constructed um, to figure out the quality of the application. They look at how much value it provides to them and like what it's, what it's achieving in terms of, um, uh, in terms of the, um, the value prop of the app. So um, in order to start thinking like a user, I think one thing to recognize is the difference between perception and reality. Um, one thing that's really stuck with me from my university degree is, um, is a quote um, or uh, an explanation from my HCI professor, um, Chris Liu, and um, he once told me that um, in German there's two ways to say, um, to say reality. One of them is, and pardon my German, Realität, which uh, refers to uh, the actual existence of reality, so the factual um, existence of the thing um, that is what reality is, and then the much harder to say Wirklichkeit, um, which refers to your perception of that thing. So um, you as a, as a person, no one can tell you that what you perceive is, um, is wrong, that is your perception of something, um, whether or not you have formed um, a good opinion or a good, um, a valid assumption of something, um, that's what is up for debate, but your perception of something is something that is internal to you. So um, knowing the difference between um, something that is literal and real and, so, and the way that you perceive it is the first step to being able to, um, being able to understand the uh, ways to save time when looking at code. Right, um, so a physical example that I want to go through quickly is um, the benefits of plants in an office space. So you can have a look at the, the benefits in the, um, at the article below if you like. Um, but let's say that Cliff comes to me one day and says, hey Nick, I read about some pretty sweet benefits of having plants in the office, um, hurry up and make it happen. So I'm like, all right, cool, yep, I'll just go have a look. What are the benefits of plants in the office? Well, it turns out they help to reduce stress. Um, they, they connect people more to, like they release endorphins. They, I mean, I'm not sure exactly um, which chemicals they release, but um, you can have a look. You can have a look in the uh, um, in the article. There's links to all the studies that it references. Um, they help to increase productivity. They reduce sickness, make workspace um, happier. They clean the air, and they help reduce noise levels, and they can boost creativity. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to do this. Like, what do I need to do to make it happen? Well, I need to go and ask everyone who's allergic to things, like which things they're allergic to. I need to order some plants from a nursery. I need to buy plant food. I don't even know what plants eat. Do they eat dirt? I don't know. Um, <laughs> we need to hire someone to, to put them in the office and make sure they don't immediately die from not enough light or too much light or whatever plants need, um, and hire someone to water them to make sure that they continue being alive in the future. Um, but, if we take a step back and have a look at the difference between what, what someone asked me to do and what I can actually do, um, let's take a look at the problem. So I've got two, two plants down here. Um, can anyone tell me which of these is real and which one is fake? They're both fake. Right, put your hand up if you think the, this one is real. about half the room, and put your hand up if you think this one is, is real. All right, well, yes, so there was one right answer, they're both fake. Um, <laughs> I never said that one of them was real, um, but um, I did ask you which one was um, real and fake. Um, so, yeah, like, the, the idea behind this is that noticing that even though this one does look a little bit more mangy and does actually look like it's a little bit more alive, that was the general consensus, um, that we actually might be able to get away with um, uh, not having to do all of these really hard things. If we have a look, most of these are centered around kind of like uh, maintaining a living being. Something like, um, what do they eat? Um, uh, making sure that they don't immediately die. You don't have to worry if fake plants immediately die. They're definitely not going to die. Um, they just exist. So um, if we have a look at the benefits of, of plants, um, we can see that a lot of them actually relate 
to some kind of psychological benefit from the person. So it's their perception of being able to, to see a plant or, or be more connected with things that are green because we treat, we, we, um, we treat green things as being more closer to nature or making us happy. Um, you'll see that, that one to four and seven are all about the psychological um, kind of intake of what having something that looks like a plant in the office is around. Um, number five, cleaning the air. Definitely plants can't clean the air unless they have a machine in them which can clean the air, which would be cool, I guess. Um, and uh, six, I'm not sure whether plastic plants actually reduce noise levels, but I'd hazard a guess that, um, that just having more stuff in an environment is actually what um, reduces the noise level. Uh, more things that absorb sound rather than um, reflect sound um, would be the thing that actually reduces the noise level. Um, and as I said, things we need to make this happen dramatically less. We just order some plants from the internet and put them wherever you want. So we nearly get all of the benefits with um, two fifths, if we assume that all the, all the effort was linear, um, two fifths of the effort. But um, speaking to, to what Laura said yesterday, it's very tempting to go with the first most obvious solution, like the thing that you're asked to do. As a developer, we see a problem and, and we go, I know how to solve this. And then you stick with that solution um, and, and it's hard to force yourself to think outside the box. And that's what I really want people to, to have a think about from, from today's presentation. So, um, yeah, really critically think about the difference between imitation and reality. Um, and we often see imitation or some things that are fake as a bad thing. Um, but I would say if, if looking like, um, if, if looking like you, you do what you're supposed to do is indistinguishable from the real thing, is it actually fake? Like if it's, if it's providing you that value, is it actually fake at all? And of course we've got another case. So um, what, <laughs> what if I want to eat the office plants, you say? Tim. Um, that is a good question. What do, what do you do if you want to eat the office, uh, the office plants? Well, <laughs> this is what we know in developing as an edge case. So there's, there's the, um, the idea that um, in, in programming, if we, if we cater to edge cases, we could be programming forever. This is what happens with scope creep. This is what happens when we're, when we're developing, we see things come up. Often we want to fix these edge cases and make sure that all of that our, that our code and that our product is taking account of all of these things. But um, we need to make sure that we don't pre-optimize for the person that wants to eat the office plants. Um, the value that they're getting from being able to eat the office plant is only, is only a very small thing compared to the value that everyone else gets from having just the plants in the, um, in the office. Um, so I would defer spending effort on things that cater towards edge cases until, um, until you're, um, you're sure that other users actually want that thing. Um, Unless, of course, you know that you're going to need that thing in the future, and this is always the, the juggling act. If you need that thing in the future, and it's going to cost you 10 times more effort to do the thing in the future, you can consider doing it now. But um, just get Tim an edible plant that he can eat in his own desk. <laughs> All right. Um, so yes, place value on time to market and ease of implementation, because those kind of things, getting things out, understanding that hindsight, and making sure that you iterate on your design is a, a really important um, thing in this space. So, um, right, let's uh, talk about the last one, last um, bit that I want to, as we'll go for a little bit longer hopefully, um, is the examples. So, um, some of the, um, yeah, uh, I want to take you through some of the tricks that we use at Canva um, to get things done and how we test our ideas. So, you've probably definitely heard of this saying before, which is if a tree falls in a forest, no one's around to hear it, doesn't make a sound. Um, and I have a developer version for you, which is if you put a hack in your code and never becomes a problem, is it really a hack? Um, this one actually does have an answer. Well, for me personally, this is my like personal mantra. Um, no, it's, it's a solution. Like if you, think that, if you think something is hacky, but it never ever causes you a problem, it is a solution and you don't have to fix it. Um, it's when it causes you a problem that you have to actually fix it. Um, and as, as developers, our um, initial instinct is to, make things, uh, is to make things right and to make it comfortable. But um, pushing yourself outside of that zone and uh, leaving some of those things in to see whether they actually cause problems um, can actually be a very useful exercise. Um, and this actually means critically evaluating the outcome and flow and effects of your decisions. Um, and one way you can do that is if you have to make a decision like this where you're not really happy with something, um, don't, don't forget about it. Write it down somewhere. Put it in a spreadsheet. Um, treat it like a task that you have to come back to later. 
um, or some kind of thing that you want to evaluate. Um, have a big list of, um, of decisions that you've made and actually look at the outcome of them. I think you'll be surprised to find that um, you often remember the things that go wrong, but the right decisions that you've made are very hard to evaluate. So finding a way to, excuse me, finding a way to um, get that feedback and understand how um, your decisions are making an impact on your project is really important. Now, um, fake it until you have time to make it is, um, is my, uh, my take on, the, on that classic saying. Um, because uh, a lot of the things we can do as developers, there's a lot of tools that we have um, and creative ways that we can structure code in order to um, make it look like our app is doing something when in reality we're doing 10 other things that, um, that are not quite as pleasant. So, Let's have a little bit of a look at the, at the Canva app now. So this is um, uh, something that's been in the app for, um, for forever, so for the last three, three or so years for the iPhone. Um, and and it's, a, um, it's a system where you click on a template um, and it transitions somewhat nicely from, um, from that list view into the editor. Um, and... Um, Basically, when we were doing this, we found that um, because the editor uses, uh, entirely uses auto layout, um, and we don't necessarily know all of the um, all of the sizing information for what the editor needs to look like at the time when we instantiate it, um, we need to actually lay it out. Um, but the designer wanted it so that um, as soon as you tap on something, it immediately starts transitioning into the into the next um, phase. So we have a problem where we need to know what it looks like before it's made, and we need to make it before we know what it looks like. So um, uh, one way that we got around this is we have this loading controller that goes between them um, and what it actually does is, um, is um, what it actually does is as as you tap on um, as you tap on a uh, on a um, image there um, it takes the image that's in that cell um, puts it into, uh, it asks the editor where it thinks it's most likely going to um, have the canvas end up when it's finished laying out um, using a bunch of uh, um, offsets that we've, uh, that we've calculated and depending on the, um, on the size of the design and everything we know about it. Um, and then it um, just animates nicely from the position in the list to, um, to where we think the, uh, uh, the editor's going to be. Um, and the code for that actually saw a little bit of it um, here, it's got a nice fix me on it, um, which is calculate the target rect based on the thing we actually want it to, to lay out on. Um, this, this function has been in there for three years, and in the last um, three years, we've only ever had to fix it, I think, twice. Um, once was when the, um, we implemented multi-page editing, um, and the actual size of that editing space disappear, uh, changed slightly. Um, we needed to adjust a few of the offsets. And um, uh, once again, when the iPhone 10 came out, and our assumption about the, the amount of space required if there's a safe area offset um, changed. Um, and that was something that actually saved us quite a bit of time in restructuring our editor or trying to figure out how we can actually figure out that layout. Um, yeah, another another example of um, another example of uh, something that we've done is this um, live camera view. So if you tap on the the camera in the um, oh that's the plan. Um, if you tap on the on the camera in our um, oh yeah, I took them from my Airbnb by the way. So <laughs> I have to take them back later. Um, <laughs> Um, an example of, of this as well is that um, when you tap on the camera icon in the, uh, in the editor, it takes you into a mode that looks kind of like the editor, um, but actually what it's doing is um, taking all of the components of the page that aren't that cell, um, duplicating them, and, and fading in between this view controller, and uh, putting it basically fading it on top. Um, and you can see that like, everything is in pretty much exactly the same place, um, but it's actually an entirely different um, view controller. And the reason why this is really useful is that um, uh, 
in order to get the video layer inside the editor, and there's other cases where there's multiple cell grids and all sorts of things, um, we needed to be able to inject it, um, which means handling all of that state and um, doing it in a way that allows you to um, clean up after yourself was actually quite an um, interesting task at the time. But rather than solve that problem, which was a much larger task, we basically just duplicate the entire view hierarchy, inject the layer where we know the user had already tapped, um, change all the state that we need to, and at the end, when a user has um, taken their picture, we just throw the whole view controller away. Um, and in 99% of cases, um, everything is in exactly the same spot before and after, um, and so it actually just looks like it fades, it fades in and out, even though um, it's, it's an entirely different view controller. So um, things like that help to save you a lot of time in the long run. So um, something that was potentially days of engineering um, cut down to, to a small spike. Um, another thing we use a lot of is view snapshots. So um, taking um, a, a snapshot of or a rendered image of your UI and displaying that in place of UI um, buys you a little bit of time to, to rearrange things in the background. So if you want to take a view snapshot, um, it's actually really, really easy now. So they have a block-based API. You don't have to learn core graphics anymore or understand what graphics contexts are. You just need to have a, a renderer format um, and a renderer. And um, you can pick one of two different um, rendering modes. Um, that's our internal switch in there. But um, you can either draw your view from the layer, which uh, may not have all of the UI view um, uh, rendered artifacts in it, like the UI blur view or, or something like that. Um, or you can draw it from the hierarchy, which has a lot more fidelity, um, but takes a little bit longer to, to draw into that context. Um, an, example of, um, an example of that is our sharing screen. So if you tap share in the corner, um, it takes a snapshot of what the canvas looks like. And again, this is another this is another view controller entirely. It, it quickly took a snapshot of what the canvas looked like, animated that backwards. It means we can do anything we want to this. It doesn't need to be a live canvas view anymore. Um, so uh, I actually recently refactored this to make it work outside of the editor as well. Um, and if we go back to picking a template, um, it works the same way. So it just um, has an image, has a, um, a source rex that it um, grabs at the start and puts it into the right spot. Um, so um, having, having this view be a little bit more modular and a little bit less tied to the way that the canvas works actually ended up being a, a large benefit in the end. Um, and that's probably... Um, Another good tip as well is making your, and I've talked about this in the past at previous dev worlds, making your code modular and your view controller self-sustaining can help you reuse a lot of them in the long run. If, you, if your dependency between, um, between your sharing view and your editor, for example, um, is just um, two, two CG recs and an image, then it's much easier to reuse that than if it's um, an entire um, custom class of, of canvas view. So reducing the dependencies um, and making things more modular um, can help quite a bit in the long run. Um, a few more really simple things um, that I didn't have time to put examples in is uh, something like adding a spinner just makes things feel so much faster even though they aren't. Um, often we have to um, give the illusion that things are happening um, uh, even when uh, nothing is going on. Like we might just be waiting for a network call to come back or we might know that we have to wait a certain amount of time. Um, it's really easy as a developer to, to miss that um, this is actually causing frustration to a user because we know what it's doing. We know why we have to wait. A user will never know why they have to wait. Um, so um, always adding some kind of feedback into there will help tremendously. Um, and in that regard, just like trying to see the experience through the eyes of your users and, and just forget about what you know about the app. So you built it. You're the person who knows the most about what it's doing at any given time and about why bugs exist in it and why, um, and, and why uh, it has the quirks that it does. Um, but giving it to someone else and viewing it through their eyes, getting them to explain aloud what they're doing or uh, watching where they tap and where they don't tap will give you a, a good insight into how a person that has no idea what's going on will, um, will react to those kind of situations. So um, in summary, um, my three big... Um, uh, big things on how to make it look like you know what you're doing is to have the right approach, 
So an MVP approach where you're, you ruthlessly prioritize the things that you need to get done first, deliver that value to the user immediately, um, get that feedback, see what they're thinking about things, use that hindsight to generate um, the next version um, and uh, really refine your process. Um, have the right frame of mind. Um, forget that um, we, we tend to um, think of imitations or fake things as taboo, and, oh, not taboo, um, uh, as, as inferior and, um, and really have a look at, uh, critically analyze um, the reasons why you need to do something in order to provide um, the largest amount of value with the minimum amount of effort. And um, use the tools that, that Apple have given us, use the tools that you can come up with internally to, um, to really accelerate um, your, your development and um, hopefully make it look like you know what you're doing. Um, as I said at the start, my name is Nick Witterson, I work for Canva. If you have any interest in working in a growing startup, please come and talk to me afterwards, but um, that's all I've got. Thank you very much.